Hey, good morning, everyone, brothers and sisters in Christ. This is, uh, this is really cool. I am excited to be able to speak to you. Um, I love the Church of, of God, and uh, it's always a, a blessing. Uh, when Pastor Jeff asked me if I'd fill in, I say, I never say no to that. I, I love preaching the Word. I love interacting with um, fellow believers, and I never say no, which is interesting because back in the day, even when I was a young Christian, Speaking in front of people was my worst fear. Shows the power of God, what he does. When he calls you, he equips you, he, uh, he will do everything necessary. So don't be afraid to follow him in whatever he calls you to do. Uh, so again, my name is Adam um, Hoblitzel, and uh, our family is relatively new to this town and to this church. Came last summer. Uh, we came to join the uh, staff at Alpha Omega Institute. This weekend has been a busy weekend. We just celebrated our 40th anniversary, though we've been here a short time. Dave and Mary Jo Nutting started Alpha Omega back in 1984, and a lot of things have happened. It was a really cool time of celebration, but I am tired, so pray for me that I have strength to get through a second a second sermon. Um, I know he will. He's awesome. I want to introduce you to my family up here on the uh, picture. A lot of you know them already, especially my wife. The, the Bible says that God... Uh, is the giver of good wives, you know, good wife from the Lord. And um, so he, he gave me a good wife for sure. I was, I was hoping for, you know, just a decent woman and he gave me an angel. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, cheesy. <laughs> she's not that, sorry. She's, she's wonderful, but that was a cheesy joke. Um, but yeah, I love Angel and a lot of you know her. Uh, she sings up here on stage with the worship team at times and, and every, I know all the women in women's ministry know her and love her. Um, so I rely on her to give me a good name as well. And then my kids, if you've met Maisie, uh, if you just go up and talk to her, she'll be your best friend for life. She's never met a stranger, and she's never stopped talking. <laughs> and my son Milo is four, uh, Maisie's eight, Milo is four, and he is an active, he is so a boy. Uh, the more ambunctious, the better, tons of energy, and uh, he is hilarious too. So God's blessed um, us with a great family, and now we have a great church family as well. We're so glad to be here. Um, a little bit, bit about myself. Um, I became a believer when I was 13. I had grown up hearing the gospel, but uh, at that point I heard the gospel from a speaker who connected God himself to my heart. I'd never heard that connected before. Uh, God was distant. He was religious. He was powerful. Um, I better obey him. I better do what's right. Be a good boy but I never connected my heart to God. Like He actually loved me and cared for me until that fateful day in 1990. Um, so the last 34 years, I've been walking with God, and it's never been a dull moment. Um, I never s- stopped growing. It's awesome to walk with God. Uh, <clears throat> he called me into youth ministry, and most of my adult life, I've been teaching young people, middle school and high school and college. And now here with Alpha Omega, our focus is with the college students, especially over at CMU. Pray for us. It's a fertile field, but it's also some hard ground sometimes um, with those students, but they are hungry for the truth, whether they know it or not. So it's been a blessing to do that. Um, besides that, I uh, love drumming. I drum up here on the, with the team sometime. I love getting outdoors, mountain biking, running, climbing mountains. I love all that. I love long walks on the beach. And uh, I, re- I really do, actually. <laughs> uh, so that's a little bit, a little bit about me, but let's move on into uh, what God has for us today. Uh, the main text this morning are three different places: Genesis one, Genesis three, and First Corinthians two. So we'll take them one at a time, looking at three uh, parts of who man is. What are the two most important questions a person can ask and answer in their lives? Well, I think they are these two: Who is God, and who is man? These are not just theological questions. They're not just academic. They are vital for how you live your life. Everyone asks and answers them, whether you do it consciously or not. Who is God? Some people might say, nothing. He's a figment of your imagination. Other people say, well, he's this, or he's this, or he's this. They make God into what they want him to. Uh, Who is God, though? What does the Bible say about that? That is the most important question there is. Today, we are going to focus in on the second question, though. Who is man? Who is Adam? I know some of you don't know me from Adam, but hopefully after today you will know me a little bit better. Uh, who is Adam? The word Adam in Hebrew obviously means man. It means from the earth, and that's what uh, Adam's name was, but it's also who he was. He was from the earth. He was a created being. Who is man? These two uh, 
questions, who is God and who is man, correlate with the two greatest commandments that Jesus gave us. He said, these two things are above all and you, everything falls under them. The law and the prophets, everything falls under them. To love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love people, to love your neighbor as yourself. So it's not just, again, theological uh, out there questions. These have to do with how we live our lives. <clears throat> so who is man? I went to a state school in Kansas, University of Kansas, and I majored in psychology. And the reason I did that is because I'm fascinated by people. People are weird. All of us are. <laughs> we are strange. I mean, why do we think the way we do? Why do we behave the way we do? Why do we end up following the crowd in the way we do? There's so many intricate things about The Bible insists that we are um, so valuable and so wonderful to God, but we are weird. We are strange. And sometimes I ask God, it's like, why do you put up with us? David said that, right? He said, when I consider your heavens, how wonderful you are, God, what is man that you're mindful of him? And I agree. But I hope today we can look at what is man and we can see some amazing insights. I hope this blows your mind today. I really do. I'm praying that it will. Um, that not only tell us who we are, but reflect back on who God is and just make us more and more thankful for who he is and what he did through Jesus. Um, all right, so this will be relatively fast. Hopefully eye-opening, it'll be a ride. I'll try not to speak too fast. Hang on. Be ready with your Bibles too. Uh, some of the scriptures I'll have up there, but are three ma main passages I want you to look up in your own Bibles if you have one. So, uh, so go to Genesis 1, and as you do that, let me pray for uh, God's blessing on all this. <clears throat> Lord God Almighty, you have created all things for you, created by you and for you, and then it's wonderful that you're our creator. Uh, you have made man in your image and um, set him just a little below the angels and crowned us with glory and honor. It's amazing. I pray we'd see some wonderful things from your word today. Psalm 138, 2 says that you exalt above all things your name and your word. In other words, who you are and what you say. Those two things never change. We exalt those things today too. Your name, who you are, we worship you. And we exalt your word too as true and forever unchanging and what we can base our lives on and find our hope in. We, wor we worship you and give you glory. Now, bless the reading and preaching of your word today through me and for all yours that hear it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so let's start with the first state of man, created man. You might also call this innocent man if you get into theolo theological terms again. Um, innocent, not uh, just meaning without what we're going to be talking about soon. When, when he became fallen, uh, we were no longer innocent. Created man, though, was, was created perfect by God. Let's look at a, just a quick overview of, of Genesis 1. We're not going to read it. I'm just going to go over it a little bit. God's very first relationship to us is given in Scripture is that of creator. We are his creatures. He's the creator. If you skip that, you, skip, you end up starting off on the wrong foot. Trust me. This is why we at Alpha Omega, we start with creation. It's such a foundation to lay. You need to know that God is creator. And Romans 1 says, if you deny God as creator, that's when your mind starts going down a slippery slope of depravity. Uh, so there's a warning there. Start with God as creator. He's so much more than that, but, he, but if he's not that, you can really start to distort who he is. So Genesis 1 gives us the creation story, the six days of creation. Starts out with God saying, let there be light. And light just flew out of his mouth. And it, was, it must have been amazing to see. Um, and then day two, obviously, he made the firmament and the waters above it and the waters below it. And there's so many cool things about that we could talk about. Day three, he uh, separated the land and the waters and, and brought up vegetation on the land and started to mature his creation on earth. Day four, he just casually made outer space and everything in it. It's funny. The sun and the moon, and oh, by the way, he made the stars. Trillions and trillions and trillions of them. They keep upping their estimate every time they look further into space. But I can't remember the exact number, but each one of us on earth could own several trillion of them to ourselves if we divvied them out. There's so many out there, but God just casually breathed them out, knows them each by name and by number. Pretty amazing, day four. Day five, God started making the creatures on the earth, the, land, the uh, sea creatures and the creatures that fly in the, in the air, in the firmament. Day six, he made all the land creatures from the big dinosaurs down to the creepy crawlies. He made all of them. Uh, and then you get to the afternoon, I guess, of day six just before Eve. Bad joke, sorry. Um, and we get to uh, chapter, uh, or sorry, verses 26 and 27, and to the pinnacle of his creation where he does something different. There's like a big pause and a big breath, and he makes man. So let's look at uh, 
Genesis 126. <clears throat> Get a drink real quick. Okay, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock and over all the earth, and over every, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. <clears throat> So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. When God repeats himself a lot, you know what's important? Um, He says over and over again, I created them. And in my image, those are the two things. We were created by God. We didn't evolve. (laughs) We were created by God, specially and intentionally. And we were made in God's image. There's so much there. This is our origin story. Every one of us has a worldview, and it starts with an origin story. Where did we come from? Um, maybe you're a fan of some of the movies out there. Like, I'm not a big superhero movies fan, but they keep going back and say the origin story of Wolverine or whoever, because everybody's fascinated with the character and they want to know, where did he come from? What's what's behind there? Uh, so they're very popular uh, in the media. Our origin story is that we're made in God's image, day six. Made in God's image. There's so much that's, very, that's there. God had called all the rest of the uh, creation on the days when he made them. He said, these things are good. It's good. It's good. When he made man, at the end of that, he said, everything's very good. He, he upped up the ante there for us. He said, it's very good. So the question is big. What does it mean that we're made in God's image, if this is so important? And it is. Well, let's look at, look at that for a little bit. A few things. One, we are set apart or different from the rest of creation. Another word for that is holy. We are holy. We are made differently than the rest of creation in a lot of cool ways. We're going to look at that. Uh, how those, that is in a second. Number two, we have value in God's eyes because he loves us. Notice how I worded that. I didn't say God loves us because we are valuable. That's a twisted doctrine. Make sure you don't put man at the center of the universe. God loves us because he is love. We have value because he loves us, not the other way around. Sometimes we get so centered on ourselves. Pop the, pop, uh, psychology does this all the time, the self-esteem stuff. Be aware of that. I, uh, again, majored in psychology, and I was like, everything's based on an evolutionary naturalistic worldview and based, pretty much puts man at the center of the universe. Don't do that. You do that, things start to go badly pretty quick. We are important to God. We are loved by God, but he is the center of the universe. As you raise your kids, grandkids, don't make them the center of the universe, okay? That's a horrible thing you can do for them. They become terrors. And it's a horrible place to think you're the, they'll be very unsettled too because it, they're not meant to be the center of the universe. God is. Teach them who God is. Teach them who their creator is. Uh, third thing, we reflect God's glory. Kind of like the moon reflects the sun. We have some of God's glory in us, but it's not from us, it's from God. And we reflect it. We're meant to. God shows who he is through his creation, especially through us. It's pretty awesome. <clears throat> and fourthly, we are like him in many ways. Revelation 2 talks about the church in Ephesus and says, hey, remember the height from which you're fallen. Don't forget where you came from. We are fallen creatures, yes, but don't forget what might be called original glory. God made us glorious. He made us not to be fallen, but to be um, reflective of him and his image. It's pretty pretty wonderful to, to, yes, you recognize original sin. That's an important doctrine we'll get to in a second, but original glory is also super important to know. Okay, so how are we created like God then? There are certain ways we are and certain ways we are not. These are super important to get correct. How are we made like God? Just a few things. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is a few important things. Number one, we are uh, made like God in that we have relationship. We are made to love. Is that not true? And one of our greatest needs is to not only be loved, but to love others. God has made us in his image. God is love. And we are made in his image. Let me ask you this. Was God love before he created humans? Yeah, he was. Some people think, oh, God had nothing to do or no purpose in life until he made people. And then he's like, all of a sudden I have, like I have a pet now or something. No, God was in perfect relationship and love community in the Trinity before any of us ever were. Don't think that God was up there bored or he was unfulfilled or incomplete before us. He wasn't. He has so much to offer. He made us out of the abundance of himself, not from some lack, that's for sure. Um, It's important to understand that we are made in God's image and to to understand, too, what that says. If you look back at verse 26, it says, "Let let us make man in our image. Notice the us and the our. God's not being a British monarch here and speaking the royal we. He is speaking in the plural because the Trinity is plural. God the Son, God the 
uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We are made in the image of a them, okay? I'm not going to try to explain the whole Trinity to you. It's way past us. It just blows our minds. But God is one God, but he is also three persons. And he had perfect relationship and love and trust and wonderful things going on in the Trinity. He did not need us to complete himself. So we are, again, made out of the abundance of the Trinity, made in the image of a them. That is super important. We're going to come back to that later when we see how we've fallen. Um, <clears throat> secondly, how are we made like God? We're made in that we can, we can be creative and we can work. God worked for six days and he rested. He didn't rest because he was tired. He just ceased his work. But he worked. He loves to work. Jesus said, my father's at his work to this very day. He loves to work. Work's a good thing. The fall has crashed it. So we all have experienced those times when we're working. We just love it. It's wonderful. Maybe it's rare, but um, it wasn't meant to be this drudgery. It wasn't meant to be sitting in a cubicle all day and just hating it. It was meant to be um, part of who we are as, as humans. So good work. We all know what good work feels like sometimes, and we're made for that. And we are made creatively as well. We are made to create. Use your creativity. You're reflecting God's image when you do that. Thirdly, we have reason. We're made thinking creatures. We're, and we're made to think with reason and logic like God thinks. Mathematics, that's all part of how God thinks and reasons and uses numbers. Uh, those things aren't accidents. That's how God is. So when we use them, we are reflecting God's image. And in the fallen state, obviously, we don't reason and use logic as much as we used to, especially in our culture. <laughs> but that's how we were made. Fourthly, we are made emotional creatures. We have emotions. And those emotions aren't evil. Don't ever call them evil. Do not be ruled by them. Do not be led by them. But God is an emotional God. All through scripture you see him. He is sad and grieved. He is angry. He is joyful and, and uh, loves things. Jesus was the same way. You look at him, he's a very emotional person. Read the Psalms, our, our prayer book, and see the wide variety of emotions there. We're made as emotional creatures. It's a good thing. And finally, language and communications. We have a lot more capacity for that than do the animals, obviously. Animals can communicate in certain ways. They can do mating calls and stuff like that. Hopefully we do more than that. Um, <laughs> but we can communicate deeply, intimately with words. God is the original originator. By his word, things were created. Jesus is the living word. There's some depth there. It's amazing. We are made in God's image, and that's how come we can use deep words that mean more uh, than the animals can use. All right, there are some ways we are made not like God, too. This is equally as important to understand this as we get into the next section. You'll see why. <clears throat> we are not little copies of God. We are made in his image, so we are like him in some ways. But we are not like God in that we are not omnipotent. That means all-powerful. We are very limited in our power. If you doubt that, just wait. One day, something will fall apart in your body and you'll die or whatever. I, all of us know that, right? We are not all-powerful. We like to think we are sometimes, um, but we are not. We are not omniscient, a big word that means all-knowing. We don't know everything, not even close. Uh, God is, though. He knows everything. We are not omnipresent. God is everywhere at once because he is not bound by space. We are. I cannot be here and over there at the same time. I'm bound by space. God is not bound by those things. He created space and matter and time. Speaking of time, we are not infinite. We are bound by time. God is not. This explains at least a little bit some of the questions you might have about God, like, oh, what do you mean predestined? Well, God's outside of time. He can see all of time at once. He's, he's not bound like we are. It's not that he necessarily controls us like robots, but he can see it all. He's sovereign over everything because he's not bound by his own creation. He created these things. So we are not like God in those important ways, and there's one more extremely important reason we are not like God, and that's coming up, and hopefully it'll blow your mind. Okay, let's look to uh, Genesis 3 now, to the second state of man, fallen man. There's so many cool things in here, and I'm not going to do it justice, but I'll do what I can today. Let's start reading in Genesis 3, verse 1. <clears throat> what happened? What happened to us? Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat? Of the fruit, uh, sorry, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. That's not what God said, by the way. <laughs> and the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, 
<clears throat> she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Okay, stop there for a second. Here we encounter the three lies from the serpent, from Satan who came, came in the form of a serpent to deceive and to trick humanity because he hates God and he definitely hates us made in his image. The first two lies um, are about God, specifically the third one really deals with man. So again, who is God, who is man? Satan attacked uh, all of that. Lie number one was, you cannot believe what God says. He says, did God really say? Boy, he sure uses that trick today, doesn't he? How many people doubt what God says? How much criticism and outright attack is there of the Bible today? Tons, all over. It's very trendy, even in the church, to do it. Did God really say? That's his first lie. Get people to start doubting God's word. Lie number two is like, you can't trust who God is. God's a liar. He's evil. He is telling you a lie. You will not surely die. Uh, I think God said that you would. And he says, now you will not. Um, you're evil. He's holding, you're holding things back on you. God knows that if you eat of it, you will get something extra. He's holding out on you. He paints God in a very negative light as an evil trickster. And Adam and Eve, unfortunately, believed it. Or at least Eve did. Adam, we don't know. <laughs> he was there, and he willfully disobeyed. Eve was tricked. He, she was deceived. Scripture says later that Eve was deceived. Adam was not. So it's the sin of Adam that we're actually paying for, the willful disobedience of God. Um, the first two lies lead inevitably to the, uh, the third. And in the void, if God is evil and not trustworthy, and you can't, can't rely on God, you need to dismiss God, then in the void, man must be God. And that's what he told him. You can be God. You will be like God, knowing good from evil. So Eve had great intentions. She, she said, this will make me wise. This looks good. This looks all... She had great intentions. Our, our intentions, good intentions are never enough, by the way. Truth is much more powerful than our intentions. She ate, and then Adam, again, for whatever reason, decided, I'm just going to eat too. Um, and something crazy happened. A lot of things crazy happened. Before we get to that, though, I want to make one more note. This is really eye-opening when I started to realize that. Did you notice that the first sin of Adam and Eve was not overtly moral? You ever thought about that? Is there something overtly immoral about eating a fruit? No. If you go out today to one of the orchards around here and you go pick a fruit and eat it, no one's going to say, evil, and take you away to jail. It's not going to happen. No one thinks that's immoral, but yet that's what happened. There's a reason why, okay? We're going to get into uh, more deeply. Um, eating a fruit is benign. It's not a moral act. The first immoral act we see in Scripture, it might not have been the first one, but the first one we see is Cain killing Abel. Everyone agrees that murder is immoral. And so we see quickly that the sin led to immorality, led to a decline in morality uh, when he killed, when uh, Cain killed his brother. <clears throat> but morality, I want you to understand, morality is not our root issue. Okay? God is not mad because we morally fell. They didn't morally fall. They distrusted God, who he was and what he said. That was our root issue. Morality is a symptom of that. Morality is super important. God cares about it. Okay? We are supposed to be moral. We're supposed to follow what God says. But it's important to know because I think there's a lot of uh, maybe even an unconscious thought about there that is something along these lines that um, God's kind of a pity God. He has the power. So he makes the rules, but he makes the rules because he has the power. And we kind of subtly believe that maybe God's not good. Maybe he's just kind of petty. He made these arbitrary rules, and he gets kind of whiny and mad when we don't obey him. I've, I've come across this attitude a lot with working with youth. They kind of like, well, God says I should do this. So I should. But they, they don't connect their hearts to God, and they don't understand that this is not about just some arbitrary rules. It's about who God is. It's about what he says. And it's about us being made in his image. Eve did not wake up and say, I'm going to go out and do something evil today. She didn't say that. She was tricked through a great big lie and the immoral things and all those things, all the things that happened afterwards were a result of that. We fell for a lie that promised to make us like God in a way we humans were never meant to be like God. That's the key. Exactly how? Just a second. One more thing I want to talk about before I get to it. Let's read Genesis uh, 3 again, starting at verse 7. And let's see the results of what happened right after this fall. <clears throat> Very fascinating stuff. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 
And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? He said, um, Oh, have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you, whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Okay, so many fascinating things here. <laughs> what immediately follows, follows the fall? What, what happens immediately? It's just amazing what happens if you look at it deeply. First, we're going to look at the shame game. Okay, shame entered. For the first time, humans experience shame deeply. Nakedness is, in the Bible is always a symbol of being of shamefulness. You look all through the Bible, nakedness is shame. Being clothed is a covering for shame. So they did not realize that they, they did not know shame before that. They were naked and were unaware of that it was shameful. When God came to them and said, who told you that, were, that you were naked? Another way of putting that would be like, who told you it was shameful? You've been naked all this time, and now all of a sudden you're scared to be physically naked and probably scared to be emotionally and relationally naked to each other and to me. Um, it's amazing what shame, shame does. We're so used to it, right? All we've ever known is deep shame in humanity, personally and as a society. Uh, just think about it. How often do we show our true selves, like really unadulterated, naked selves? I don't mean physically. Wear clothes, please. But show ourselves to each other. How often are we guarded by what we call our personality or are we guarded by the things we think are acceptable to society so we kind of guard ourselves? I do it too. We all do. Um, one of the wonders of marriage is that you come together and you are naked physically, but you're also naked relationally, or at least more so than any other relationship. And that shows us it's a picture of Christ and his church. Pretty amazing. Think about it though. Shame rules our world. Everything shameful rules our world. We did not know it before the fall. So Adam and Eve, very illogically, were scared all of a sudden to be naked before each other and before God. They tried to cover their shame with little, they made little loincloths with fig leaves. We try to do the same thing all the time. We're always trying to cover our shame. How, what will people think of me? How will people take me on this? We, we do it all the time. It's a human condition. Do we understand a little bit more what happened at the fall if we understand the shame game? Finally, the most, the most uh, illogical thing of all is they hid from God, like you can hide from God. When God said, where are you? He wasn't saying, I don't know where you are. He was saying, Adam, where are you? We used to walk together. We used to have this intimacy, and all of a sudden you're hiding from me now? Why? It made no sense. No sense. But it does make sense if we understand how we fell and why. Uh, after the shame game came the blame game. <laughs> They started blaming. Our society does that too. We don't like to take responsibility. We don't like to think that we're the problem. We like to blame other people. We like to blame society. We like to blame God for things. So Adam blames Eve, right? First thing. That's a woman's fault. One thing that's interesting is subtly he also blames God there. <laughs> he says, God, the woman you gave me, yeah, nice passive-aggressive statement there, Adam. The woman you gave me, she caused it. So he's actually blaming God. If you wouldn't have given me this woman, yeah, a few verses earlier, he was praising God for how wonderful she was, and I don't blame him. Well, women are wonderful. But he says, the woman you gave me, it's her fault. God gave him an opportunity. He's, where are you? Have you eaten from the tree? He gave him an opportunity to came clean, come clean with the sin. Who knows what would have happened if Adam would have come clean right away? I don't know. We were still falling, but who knows what could have happened. But instead, nope. I'm going to blame it on Eve. I'm going to blame it on you, God. It's your fault. And boy, they bought the lie, didn't they? So God turns to, to Eve, to the woman. She blames the serpent. The devil made me do it, right? And she's partly right. I mean, Satan came in. He's the one who tricked him, but she's not taking responsibility. He gives her a chance to come clean too, and she doesn't do it. That is our condition. We're so full of shame today. We're so full of blame today. We realize where it's come from. <clears throat> All this happens immediately. Because you could say, well, God said they'd die, but they didn't. Well, they did. Spiritually, they started dying. These things are results of spiritual death. After this comes the curses. I have no time today to examine them. They're also very fascinating. If you just take a look at Genesis 3, the curses are not God being spiteful. He brought the curses in to hit woman right where she's at, to hit man right where he's at, and to show him a need for a savior as a grace that God gave the curses. Wonderful thing. He is such a gracious God. 
It might seem harsh. Oh, how would you make things hard? Because if he didn't, we would never come back to him. We'd be lost forever. So he uses the curses to draw us back to himself. This chapter, Genesis chapter 3, is the best treatise available on human psychology. You want to know the condition of man, look at Genesis chapter 3. It tells you everything you need to know. There is one more thing I want to um, look at before we move on to the third state of man. And uh, I want to skip ahead again, past the curses to, cha- to uh, chapter 3, verse 20, if you look at there, there with me, to something fascinating. I hope this blows your mind. Verse 22, uh, or actually let's start in verse 20 and read through 24, and then I'm going to focus in on 22. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So let's look back at verse 22. One time I was reading this several years back and it, it just hit me like a truck. I was like, I was reading that and I was like, wait a minute. Was Satan telling the truth? I read verse 22 and I said, was Satan telling the truth? And I knew Satan is a liar and father of lies, and when he lies, he speaks his native language. I'm like, no, Satan doesn't tell the truth. He tells us well-placed lies. He'll give you some of the truth, maybe 90% of the truth, and he'll throw in 10% of lies, because that's how we get tricked. We don't get tricked by an obvious lie. We get tricked by a subtle lie. It's kind of like rat poison. You don't go up to a rat and give him a bunch of poison. He won't eat it. What do you give him? A bunch of food with a little bit of poison in it, and that'll kill the rat. Satan's Methods have been the same all, all the time. He does the same thing. He takes what God has made good and what God's made true and he twists it into a lie, into something evil. That's what happens here. Because I was asking, did Satan tell the truth? God here says uh, in verse 22, uh, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. I look back at verse 5. And Satan says, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. I'm like, well, it's the exact same thing, right? Was Satan telling the truth? Do they have good reason to believe him? Every word of God is important. Every word in Scripture is important. Every jot and tittle is important, okay? There's a major difference in what is said there. And it goes back to the Trinity. Notice what Satan says. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. How did they know God? They knew him as a Trinity. Again, we're made in the image of a them. In verse 22, what does God say? Behold, the man has become like one of us. There's a huge difference there. I had never noticed it in many readings of Genesis, and it stuck out to me. I looked at all the versions of the Bible. They all say the same thing, like one of us. And it hit me. What's the condition of man? The condition of man is becoming like as if the Trinity could somehow be separated and split and broken. That's what we become. You think of it another way. We are made Trinity-esque in that we have a body, a soul, and a spirit, right? So we're made like God in that way as well. But imagine, I think the worst thing that could possibly happen in the universe is for the Trinity, the Godhead, to be broken, to be split, to be separated. That's the worst thing that could possibly happen because God is infinite good, infinite glory. For him to be separated or split, that's the worst thing in the world. And that's how God describes us. The man has now become like one of us. If you could take the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and split them up, he's become like one of us. Not relational, not based in love anymore, but something else. We've been broken horribly pretty amazing. We're like a separation of the Trinity. And then something hit me that was even more mind-blowing, because I started thinking, I was like, that'd be horrible if the the Trinity was ever separated. And I remember, on the cross, Jesus, arm stretched out, said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't believe Jesus was pretending that I think his suffering was very, very real, not just physically, but in all other ways. And I believe he was separated from his Father, we don't know how long. There's, it's a matter of debate between people. You know, did Jesus just bear the wrath of God for a moment on that cross? The, the creeds say that Jesus descended into Hades. I tend to believe that he did, that there's a spiritual um, death. The second death is the one we're really trying to... If, if Jesus didn't pay for a second death, what did he pay for? Um, he died physically, yeah, sure, but we still die physically. Is that the death he paid for? No, he paid for the spiritual death of us. I do believe that Jesus paid for it all. The wrath of God, and he was separated from his Father. The Trinity was broken. 
for just a while. The worst thing possible. So then you say, that's the worst thing possible that could happen. Then you say, God did that for us? He was wanting to do that for us? All of a sudden, the gospel, it's not just that we see our fallen state and the bad news in greater clarity. We can understand the good news even greater. It's amazing to me how gracious our God is, how deep the gospel is, how deep what God did through Jesus on the cross for us is, much more than we give it credit for. We tend to minimize the gospel. Yeah, God did some great, and I'm this bad. It's about this much difference. I need to make it up. No, it's infinite. Infinite. What has happened to us is so terrible. What God did for us is so wonderful. It's amazing. That blew my mind. I hope it does you too. Again, wrestle with it. Some people are very vehemently against this idea that Jesus died spiritually. I think everything in Scripture and and, and otherwise makes it makes sense that he did. And it just blows my mind for how wonderful it is. Um, in this passage as well, we get a picture of Jesus on the cross. Uh, God, the first death actually happens. God actually kills an innocent animal and clothes them. Picture of Jesus. Jesus died to cover our shame. Something innocent died to cover our shame. That's what we see in that passage as well. Um, and then he out of grace, again, banished them from the garden. He knew that if we ate from the tree of life in our fallen state, we'd remain fallen forever. He says, no, I love you too much. I'm going to kick you out of, out of the garden. I'm going to keep you from eating from the tree of life. I'm going to provide a savior for you. Okay? Sometimes what God does in our lives can seem harsh, but we've got to understand he's good. He knows what's best. His discipline is a good thing. It may hurt for a while, but he knows what's best. He's always trying to draw us to himself. <clears throat> Okay, let's look a little closely, more closely at this, knowing good and evil. Again, the difference between what God said and Satan said. This is the other big way we were never meant to be like God. This is vital to understand. We were never meant to be the ones who decide right and wrong. That's ultimately what Satan said. When he said, you get to know, good, be like God knowing good and evil, he's saying you get to be like God deciding good and evil, basically. Okay? Because they, they already knew who God was. They could tell what good and evil was by what God was who he was in the garden and what he was saying. He said, no, you got to decide. Isn't that the condition of our culture again today in every human life? We want to do this. We are not like God in that way, though. God is the only judge. We don't get to judge what's good and what's evil. God is the one who does that, only one. Yet, that is a mark of humanity, is that's all we do. We were meant to live in God's perfect love, relationship to him and with each other perfectly, trusting him for judgment of good and evil. What he says goes. We listen to him. We trust him. We were meant to live in that perfect place. Now, we reject what God clearly says. People reject God all the time. We're the only part of creation that rejects God. Shakes our fist up and says no. But we do it. We reject him all the time. And we trust our own ability to understand. Uh, The Bible says, lean not on your own understanding. We do it all the time. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding. We trust in our own understanding with all our heart. We lean not on the Lord. That's the human condition. That's the we're told. We have to be commanded to do it because it's not natural for us anymore. We are not intended to be like God in that way, no matter how much we deceive ourselves. We have become judges instead of lovers. We are meant to love, live in love relationships. Now we become judges. We end up judging other people all the time, and we end up judging God which is super ironic, right? Now think about it. I'm not trying to to put any guilt trips on anybody, but every time we question God, we are judging him, are we? And we say, God, how could you let this happen? We're saying, God, you messed up. I know better. Every time we say, God, I think I'll do it my way instead of what you're calling me to do, we say, I think I know better than you. Every time we willfully sin, say, God, I know you say this is wrong, but I don't think so. I'm going to do it. It's worth it to me. We judge God. I mean, just how, how gracious is God that not only have we fallen, but we actually turn our, our vitriol against him. And he still loves us and still does everything for us. When Jesus said, judge not, which is the most popular verse to quote today now, he was not talking about you can never say anybody is right or wrong. He's talking about this kind of judgment. We're so used to judging on our own, by our own opinions, by our own wisdom, others and God. He wasn't uh, saying you can never say anything is good or bad. In fact, later in Scripture, he says, hey, stop judging on mere appearances and make a right judgment. So we're supposed to do that. So don't buy that lie from the world that says, don't judge me. You can't say that I'm doing is right or wrong. Yeah, you can, but it better not be based on what you think. It better be based on what God says, okay? Let me give you an example of judging right and wrong. The abortion issue. 
I had a, a youth ask me about this one time, and it really got me thinking, and I've never forgotten it. He, he basically asked me, is like, is abortion, uh, he didn't say is abortion wrong, he said, is God pro-choice? Isn't God pro-choice? I think he said, isn't God pro-choice? I think he was trying to justify the abortion issue. And I almost said immediately, no. And I, I started thinking, I was like, wait a minute. Yes and no. And here's, let me explain what I mean by that. <clears throat> God has given us freedom of choice. He has given us free will. He loves choice. He gave us choice because I believe without our choice, without free will, we could never love God or hate each other. Love cannot exist if we're controlled. We have to freely give it and freely receive it. There's probably more to it than that. That's one, one in the answer. God is pro-choice and that he gives us uh, choice. He does not take away our ability to choose what we think and what we do. However, God has not given us the freedom to change God's laws and judgments, has he? So when it comes to the abortion issue, for example, God has given a person the freedom, if they want, to go kill a baby. Rarely will he step in. He can, and sometimes he will step in miraculously. But if I chose to abort a baby, I could do it. God does not keep me from doing that. I have choice. God is pro-choice. However, God has not given the freedom to call killing a baby right, has he? So you can kill the baby. You can sin, but you cannot say this is right, and we have to think we can. God's word, his law is eternal. It never changes. Okay, so maybe that gives a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about um, judgment. We like to judge by our own wisdom. God says, I'm the judge. I've given you everything you need to know. You need to follow what I say. <clears throat> so we see we have ceased living in love and instead chose to be judges, to be like God in a way we were never meant to be. We are deceived when we live like that. We desperately need something. We need, to, we need a Savior. We need to be redeemed. So let's look at the third state of man. Uh, redemption. Let's ask the question, first of all, what does it mean to be redeemed? By the way, you can turn to 1 Corinthians 2. That's where we're going to be. What does it mean to be redeemed? Job said, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. The biblical definition of redemption is not just good things happening out of bad things. It's that, but it's much more. Redemption means that you owned something previously and you had to buy it back because it was lost to you. That's what it means. A good example of this is in Hosea chapter 3. The prophet Hosea was told to marry an unfaithful woman. Her name was Gomer, and he had to marry her. What a name, right? I wouldn't. Anyway, <laughs> it wasn't just bad that her name was bad. She was unfaithful. She was a prostitute, and God said, She's going to be this way. And Hosea, I want you to marry her anyway. It's going to be a picture of my love. So he married her, and she gave him some sons, and then she ran off with her other lovers, uh, just as God said she would. Things got so bad in her life because she was running away from her covenant husband that eventually she ended up on the slave block. We don't know how, but she ended up a slave. And guess what Hosea was told to do? I want you to go buy her back. So in Hosea 3, it says this. Uh, let's read it. Hosea 3, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord said to me, Go again, uh, love a woman who is loved by another man as, and it is, is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. Hosea had to pay a price to receive back to himself, which was already that should work, was already his by eternal covenant. He had to pay a price for it. Buy it back. So Jesus is our promised redeemer. He is our creator. He owns us. He, uh, in every way, it says he, uh, he created things in Colossians 1. He's created us. We have become lost like a coin, like a sheep, like a son. The parables Jesus told, we become lost. And Jesus has come to buy us back for himself. 1 Corinthians 6 says, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. It was a very steep price. Jesus shed his blood, broke his body, took the wrath of God for us on the cross in order to redeem us, to bring us back into God's family. We are redeemed and adopted back into his family. This is an amazing thing. This is the gospel. Jesus now calls us to repent from our sin, to change our mind and turn to God, to believe the good news that Jesus did die for our sins. He didn't stay dead. He rose again and defeated death. We're implored to be reconciled to the Father. Jesus has done everything necessary. None of it is ourselves. We don't earn our way into it. Be reconciled to the Father because I've done everything for you. There's no room for pride here. There's no room for our works. It's not by works we're saved. It's by grace. Through faith, faith is just our turning toward God. Our, our, our turning toward him instead of away from him. That's our faith. 
The redeemed person is not only saved from God's wrath, but he's also given so many awesome things. I wish we could talk about this all day. I'm going to talk about one thing. I think one of the greatest things we've been given is the Holy Spirit to live in us. If you are redeemed in Jesus Christ, you've been given his Holy Spirit. Again, back to us being made in the Trinity. We are body, soul, and spirit. We are dead spiritually without Jesus. And that's how come we need to be given, made alive. But he didn't just like make our human spirit alive. He gives us his Holy Spirit. It is amazing. Think about it. We're going to go through this passage, and I hope you just fall over dead. No, not really. Faint. Maybe faint. Don't fall over dead. Um, let's look at 1 Corinthians. It's amazing when we look at what God has given us through his Holy Spirit. I'll try to make this quick because I know I'm going long here, but hopefully it's worth it. 1 Corinthians 2, starting at verse 6. Yet among the mature, among the mature, Paul writes, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden, hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. Amazing. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, that's that judgment again, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Spiritual here does not mean you smoke weed and live in a VW van, a van okay? Spiritual means you have the Holy Spirit of God. Some people are like, I'm spiritual. No, <laughs> you're lost. <laughs> Spiritual means you have the Holy Spirit of God. That's what it means in this passage. Let's stop there for a second. And look, this is amazing. This is a secret and hidden wisdom. You don't get it by striving. You don't get it by studying things. You don't get it by your own efforts. It's a gift from God. Jesus said you must be born again by the Spirit of God. You're born once by water, by the flesh. Nicodemus came to him and said, you must be born again. The second time by the Spirit the Spirit makes you spiritually alive. And it's amazing. It's secret and it's hidden because you won't know it until you're redeemed and receive the Holy Spirit yourself. It has always been God's plan to change it from the inside out, not the outside in. Religion says, I'm going to change the outside, hopefully the inside would follow. It never works. God gives us the Spirit and changes us from the inside out. We learn amazing things through the Spirit. God says, who knows what's in the Spirit except the Spirit of that person, Right? Can, you, can someone know your deepest thoughts besides you? No, you can try to express them and no one really knows them. Isn't it amazing that we've been given the Spirit from God so that we may know things that would be previously unknown? Jesus said the Spirit will lead you into all truth. It's amazing. We have been given the Spirit of God. So we don't live by worldly or human wisdom anymore. We live by a different kind of wisdom, a secret wisdom that's been hidden until now. The person who does not have the Spirit cannot comprehend these things. It's called the natural man or the unspiritual man. They can't comprehend this. Have you ever talked to an unbeliever about the wonders of what's going on in your life and it just feels like you're speaking another language? Yeah, it's because you really kind of are. They don't understand the things of the Spirit. It says they're foolishness, they're folly to them who do not have the Spirit. We run into that in the church sometimes. You can be a church goer, you can be a religious person and not have the Spirit. And we kind of, you can... You know, someone tries to talk to you about the deep things of God and we just don't have any, have any clue what you're talking about. Our bond, our unity as believers really comes through the Spirit of God. That's when, that's when the, our relationships become super special. Um, so no fleshly eye can see it, no fleshly ear can hear it, no fleshly heart can understand it. We need to be born again and redeemed and be given a new heart and a new mind, new eyes to see. New Year's to hear. God gives us those things through Jesus. Okay, let's look at the last two verses and we'll end with this. Uh, these, this, this will bring it all full circle back to the, what I talked about with judgment. Speaking of judgment, <laughs> hail from the Lord. No. Um, and uh, again, hopefully this last, this last truth will be amazing to see. Verse 15, the spiritual person, again, the person with the Holy Spirit of God, judges all things but is himself not to be judged or himself to be judged by no one. Whoa, what does that mean? And then it does a quote from Isaiah 40. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? 
but we have the mind of Christ. Oh, this is amazing. This is amazing. Back to the judgment, okay? The spiritual person, the person who's been redeemed and received the Holy Spirit, we have been made new. We are no longer broken and fallen. We are redeemed. How does that work when it comes to our own reliance on our judgment? Well, it says here, the spiritual person, the person with the Spirit, judges all things. How is that possible? I thought our judgment was bad. It's because we've been given the Spirit of God. We've been realigned with God, who He is and what He says. And if we live by that, which if you live by the Spirit, you will live by God's Word and God's nature. You will live by those things. You're realigned. You can make judgments about all things because you're in line with the truth, God's judgment. We don't have to rely on our own best guesses anymore. And we don't have to be ashamed anymore. We don't have to blame people anymore. We can live in freedom in the Spirit of God. It also says... The spiritual man is himself to be judged by no one. Do you know in Christ, no one can judge you? You say, well, yeah, they do. They they judge me all the time. It doesn't have to stick. It can be like water off a duck's back. We do not have to be so fearful and self-conscious of people anymore. People can't judge us. Why? Quote Isaiah 40. It says, because no one can judge the Lord. No one can be the Lord's judge. And now we have his spirit inside of us. Therefore, no one can judge us. By the way, Satan can't either. He's the accuser of the brothers. He will try to accuse you up and down, left and right, all day. Let it slide off your back. His his accusations cannot stick. You know who you are in Jesus Christ as the redeemed, and you will stand firm. Okay? It's amazing. He has redeemed us from judges back to lovers of him, connected to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he starts to redeem our relationships. Starts here in the church. It's wonderful to have relationships in the church. We're not perfect. We saw the flesh. We still mess up, but we can forgive. We can come together. We can be united in Christ Jesus, in the Word. That's why the church is wonderful. That's why the church is like nothing else on earth. Hopefully this isn't like a business or like a civics club or something, because it shouldn't be. This is amazing. Holy Spirit filled people together. We have something the rest of the the world does not understand. The angels don't even understand it. They long to look into it. But we have it in Jesus Christ. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. As redeemed people, everything starts to be renewed. Our morality, our desires, our thinking gets renewed in the Word. Our relationships, um, the way we see people, and our judgment. Our judgment gets made right. It gets aligned back with God through the Holy Spirit. And we are no longer living as these fallen, idiotic judges. Now we are redeemed children of God. As we wrap up, I want to—I just want to mention briefly, there's one more state of man that is important. We don't have time to go into depth about it, but... For the redeemed, there's one more state of man. Glorified man. I cannot wait for that day. This is part of the gospel as well. It's the inheritance of the redeemed only. If you're not in Christ, I'm sorry, you will not be glorified. You will be judged. The Bible is very clear of that. You will be forever in torment and judgment. I hate that thought, but it's true. Um, If you're redeemed, though, one day you will be back to glorify. Original glory restored. It's going to be awesome. Uh, Romans 8, verses 22 and 23 say... For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves have the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Have you ever groaned to God because this world just doesn't feel like home anymore? And because your body's falling apart? And because you want to be free of sin and death and all this other junk? Yeah, we're supposed to groan. We can, pray, we can pray groans, and the Holy Spirit intercedes through those groans for us, the Bible says. Philippians 3 says this, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we will await a Savior, the second coming of Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to even subject all things to himself. I can't wait to get my new body. I can't wait for it. It's going to be awesome to be free from sin. Finally, back to Romans 8 again. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. That leads to our redemption. And those he justified, he also glorified. This is the good news. This is the hope we're waiting for. Okay, this is the culmination of the gospel. It's not just to make us good little boys and girls here. We are going to be restored completely one day, if you have Jesus Christ. So I'll just end with this. The gospel is such good news, but when you ask the question, who is man? You need to answer correctly. You need to understand who we were created to be. It reflects on who God is if we understand who we were created to be. If we understand what has happened to us, again, 
Genesis 3. What has really happened to us? Did we just make a few mistakes? Or is there something much deeper? Do we understand what Jesus has done for us, really? His sacrifice on the cross, his going to the depths of the earth for us, man, it's unbelievable. Do we understand who we are as the redeemed, our identity in Christ? Do you understand who you are? The Holy Spirit lives in you. You're a new creature, you're not the old. Jesus didn't give you a second chance. He can give you a million chances, you're going to blow it every time. He didn't give you a second chance to get it right. He transformed you from the inside. You're a new creature, not a person who's trying to turn over a new leaf. Don't try, it won't work. And finally, if we understand the promise of the glorification still to come when Jesus returns, come Lord Jesus. If we understand all this, we understand the depths of God's love for us, we understand more how good he is, we understand more what our hope is that we can live by day by day, this should transform us forever. Thank you for listening. Let's pray.